Actually, I'm going to refill my water bottle while I have a moment or after this girl dies. Hello. No lie, that's my... Uh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I finally spelled something right. That was actually my great grandmother's name. What? That's not a bad thing. That's 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 a bad thing. It is it like you can hang meat in here. It's the so cold. Sold, it's so small. I know. There's especially like two or three of them that are <laughs> tiny. Like, are you really supposed to be in the grade? They really are. It's wild. <laughs> mm-hmm. A love like ours is love, it's hard to find. <laughs> it's been in my head for days, I don't know why. We've come too far, leave it all behind. How could we end it all this way? Do you guys think we'll start back next year all in person? Probably not. You don't think so? At this point, I don't think so. I have no intel on it. I'm just I'm just wondering. I, I was talking to Miss Kim about it, and she said that she was pretty sure her school in Georgia was going to start back all in person because if kids were going to be virtual, they've already signed up for, like, Georgia's version of virtual SC. So... They just won't go to that school anymore. Um, SOA is basically all they're all virtual. Really? Oof. There are people who have chosen to be virtual. Yeah. They don't have a, like a hybrid schedule. Oh, wow. Like they go in one state too. Hmm. I mean, I I hate hybrid. I would also I would almost rather have it either all virtual or I would definitely rather have it all in person, but it's so hard like there's there's people that i genuinely don't know what they look like because i've never seen their faces on camera and wait in this class um well in this class i at least know what everybody looks like because i've seen them previous years hmm? yeah is it not so cold in here it's like not okay <laughs> Oh, hi, Zach. <laughs> can you not touch it? You can't, it doesn't do anything. Doesn't do anything. They control it in Colombia, which is not fair. What? Yeah. <laughs> I know. So we're breathing holes because some people in Colombia. People are getting 60 something through this. They want to pay attention. What are they like? All of them the same temperature. I don't know. It's so insane. Like, you walk into one, it's like burning hot. Yes. yes. And then the next one. But also, I think they don't know how to fix it because Miss Kathan's room was like burning up and they they came over and they were like, there's nothing wrong with it. And she was like, it's 83 degrees in here. Like, it's not, not it's not okay. I thought I was on fire. Yeah, she's had a lot of problems this year. This is just like. I can deal with it. I mean, I thought I put on I thought about going out in my car because I have like a big coat in my car, but it's like 65 degrees outside. Yeah. <laughs> I think like, it's kind of warm up a little bit. I hope. I know. Like, why can't we just keep it like it's, a normal. It's, it's, I, I won't be complaining, but. You know, it's rough for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I don't even keep it this cold at night in my room with like blankets on top of me. 67 degrees. I don't want to tell me if I'm going to repeat it. Yeah. Fifty nine. 
No, that's unacceptable. I can't, I can't deal. <laughs> I know. I wish I had a ceiling fan. I would give anything for a ceiling fan. And it's not fair because like, you know, Brad and I lived at the same apartment complex yeah. and mine is supposedly updated and his wasn't, but he had all this stuff that I don't have, like a screen door and a ceiling fan and an overhead light. I'm like, your upgrade gets rid of these things? I don't understand. I know, I really complained. I'm starting to eat cold at night because I have a really long blanket, but I can't. I do too. But it's so nice. Yeah, that's true. I, I like being cold at night so that I can bundle up and like have my weighted blanket, but like, I've got this little blanket on me and that's all. It's in case you guys my, my didn't pick up on it. It's freezing in here today. It's 67 degrees. Freezing cold. Oh yeah. And they're like, don't wear those big old jackets. I can't even write my name properly because it's so cold in yeah. here. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, at least at, um, at our old building, we could control it in the room. Now that's, that was a whole different set of problems because people shared rooms and we get so Mr. Benvenuti would get so upset and he like wrote emails to everybody who taught in that room and was like, keep it between 68 and 72, nothing outside of that range. <laughs> and he would get so mad if they did. Okay. So let me kind of talk to you all about this week uh, because what we're doing each day is kind of building to later on in the week. Um, Obviously, I haven't looked at um, your essays yet, right? I have essays in several classes, so I'm like, is it? Yes, okay, I have not looked at your essays yet, but um, tomorrow is the plan for that. So today, we're actually just going to watch a video together, um, one of the AP videos, which hopefully when I have assigned those, y'all have been watching them because I, I really do mean it. They are very helpful. Um, and kids in my class last year told me how helpful they were as well. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna watch one together today. I'm not leaving you to do it on your own. And it's about incorporating, um, selecting appropriate evidence. Which, when you're writing a synthesis essay, obviously you have all these sources and you want to be able to pull from them things that are gonna help you. And we kind of fall into this trap of like looking through all the sources and just seeing a quote and being like, that looks like a good quote. Let's plug that in there. Or even, and worse, um, finding quotes from three different sources and like building a paragraph around that quote rather than letting the quote support the argument that you're making. Um, that's honestly, I think that's probably the hardest part of writing synthesis essays, uh, which is why we're watching this today. Um, tomorrow, is a success session, obviously. And so I'll probably be holding a couple of y'all back to do things. Um, but also tomorrow, I'm going to give you some sources to start looking at on your own. Thursday, we're gonna do like a little shorter activity about selecting appropriate evidence. And then Friday, uh, we're gonna write a synthesis essay in class using a prompt from, you know, either a past test or like, one that someone's created in my AP Lang teachers Facebook group, which is honestly my saving grace. Um, so everything we're kind of we're kind of doing this week is building towards writing an essay on Friday. Um, I want to go ahead and give you the sources on Wednesday so that you have time to go ahead and start looking through those. Um, obviously, with synthesis essays, it's a little bit more difficult to do like a timed in-class writing because you do get more time on those for the AP exam because you have that extra 15 minutes to read your sources. So you'll this time you'll actually have even more of an advantage because you'll get them a couple of days in advance. So that's nice. Um, I think that's all I need to say about that for now. Any questions about any of that before I move on to the video? Okay, I'm trying to get all of my many things plugged in here. You've come too far to leave it all behind. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, okay. But what I want to do today is, how do I do it? Working on it, guys, working on it. <gasps> Ooh, my mouse just got really big. Okay, I'll keep this up here, but then bring this guy Come on. Bring this guy over here. And then, Jesus, sorry. Desktop two, share this with you guys. Okay, those of you who are virtual, can you guys see the screen with YouTube on it? Okay, uh, let me just close this door. Does that say thin? Yes. I didn't think of polish as a cleaner, Robert. <laughs> The two ends. Yeah. I see. Oh, funny story. I used to get um, retentive because I used to write my ends like that when I was younger. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that seems silly. I'm like, what's the number? What's ends? And I might have to adjust this volume again, but we'll see. If two things we'll be looking at a prompt, like a 417 prompt oh, that's for good. lessons, and then another thing called 417 AP practice. About 30 seconds to grab those materials and I'll get started shortly. I like this too because it's like having a like a guest teacher in the room for a day. I'm gonna turn my face off. All right, all right. I teach AP language at Pinero North High School. It's about an hour outside of Chicago. And if you tuned in earlier this week, I'm sure you're all you know, sitting with bated breath. I was talking about how on my two days off, I was going to try to cut my husband's hair and I'm happy to report he does still have hair. And <laughs> the hair cut worked out okay. And we are still here. I will say I, I hope that's not her husband. With that line in the back of his head, but um, I am happy to report that he does have an okay, maybe not great, but an okay looking haircut. Um, but more exciting news beyond my husband's haircut or my haircutting abilities is that celebrity guests are going to start dropping into some of our AP Life classes over the next one, few weeks to recognize all of your hard work and then to provide a unique the guy real world learning Buster on the rest of development principles of AP courses me. have impacted them in their lives. So in case you wanted to tune in and hear actors or reporters uh, that you've seen on television or experts in the field, I think it was always um, fun. you can tune in and our first guest will be That's him. on Monday. You recognize him? Actor Tony Hale, you might know him from Arrest Development or Beep. He's going to join very us funny. tonight on Monday and share some of his insights. It's going to be amazing. So I hope amazing. you definitely turn in for that one. All right, so if you were here yesterday with Mrs. Knight. We were. You were right. asked for your okay. homework, your practice, to read and annotate this passage from Black. Sorry, one quick thing before we continue. Um, this passage is what we're gonna use for our activity on Thursday. So you can go ahead and be paying attention to that and they might give you some good suggestions for what you should be doing with it. Just keep that in mind. Last Child of the Woods by Richard Louvre to write a thesis statement and then to write a body paragraph um, that includes a claim, evidence, explanation, and then a connection back to the thesis. So if you haven't done that, still follow along and I'll give you a sample that might help you. If you did complete this, since we can't see what you wrote, we're gonna give you a model and then encourage you to look at yours 
side by side with the model and annotate it in a similar fashion. All right, so I'm going to ask for you first to pause the feed, take a few minutes to read through the thesis statement, and then read through the body paragraph, looking at some of our notations on the side about where that student is providing a claim, an example, an explanation, and a connection, and a transition. So pause the feed, and then I'll go through it with you briefly. So we're, we're not going to pause. We're just going to like let her sit in silence for just a minute. But all right. Well, OK, the lady, well, the thesis calm down. Pretty good. Um, but this is one example of how this is, these videos are really helpful because they actually give you like examples to do and let you do it along with them and then kind of give you suggestions for how to how to make it better. So it's really helpful. It's like having extra extra AP lessons. It has three clear choices, comparison, anecdotes, and rhetorical questions. And then the student goes beyond the prompt and says that tech gives us the effect of function, that technology is causing Americans, particularly children, to lose their connection to nature. So we see the choices and we see the function or the effect. In the body paragraph, you'll notice even just from like a visual standpoint with the coloring, the body paragraph is pretty well organized, has a good clear claim then it provides an example, it explains the example, provides another example, provides some explanation, and then finally connects back to the claim itself by looking at that major idea about technology and its effect on us, particularly children. I also love that this sample paragraph has transitions that move throughout and that it's not just something like, for example, which is great, but the student also seems like clearly or one of the ways to signal to the reader how things are shifting and moving. All right, so take again a few more minutes, pause the feed if you need to. Look at your own paragraph. Can you annotate it? And if so, do your annotations look similar? Claim, example, explanation, example, explanation, and connection. Can you circle any transitions that you use? All right, so it makes sense if we've talked about kind of like the sandwich of the essay, the introduction of thesis, and then the conclusion, and then we talked about line of reasoning and how do you organize a body paragraph. It makes sense that the next thing we would discuss is how do you select appropriate evidence to put into your body paragraph to support your claims. And when you think about the rubric itself, the big ticket item here is looking at evidence and commentary more than half of your points for your essay will come from what you write in your body paragraph, specifically the evidence and commentary. Hopefully this will be the last time I stop. I'm sorry, I know that's annoying, but um, they are, they're using this specifically as a um, rhetorical analysis essay, but the, the information is good for any type of essay. Um, the method they're talking about going about selecting your evidence that applies to rhetorical analysis, argument, or synthesis? Evidence is crucial. Um, it demonstrates your understanding of the prompt, so it will focus on, on your reading, but then it also demonstrates your competency with writing and your ability to support your claims. So having appropriate evidence, evidence is really important to your essay. When it comes to the evidence, you can see here on the rubric that it's basically arguing or suggesting that the evidence that you select needs to support all claims in the, your line of reasoning. So when Mrs. Knight was talking about the line of reasoning, that's what's really going to help guide what evidence you pick. You want to select evidence that will support that. When I'm working with my students, they tend to have questions about evidence that look like this. So like, how do I select the best examples? How many do I need? And then how do I know if it's the best? How do I know if it's appropriate? So I'm hoping that these are some questions that I can address through sharing some tips or getting like a plan of attack and idea about how do you go about choosing your examples. I like to think of it as like a play or a game and that you've got certain steps that okay. you're going to follow. So when selecting appropriate evidence, I think the first thing I would do is study your topic sentence to uncover the key ideas and choices that you're going to have to prove in that pod, body paragraph. The rubric says that your evidence should support all claims in the line of reasoning. You need to know what your claims are that you have to support. 
So it makes sense to start there. I will say it's important to have a good topic sentence to your body paragraphs and not just state the author uses caustic diction, period. But to include, like you saw in our sample for our warm up, to include what the writer is doing and why they're doing it, what is their effect or their function. Also, keep in mind that a choice could be a strategy or a device. Either one works. And in some cases, for your body paragraph, like what you saw with our warm up today, you might have two choices in a body paragraph. It really depends on the passage, it depends on your reading of the passage, it depends on your, your body paragraphs, it depends on your thesis. So know that choice is kind of vague and broad depending on you and what you encounter. All right, the second step in the plan of attack is to then find, after you've uncovered your key ideas you're trying to prove in a paragraph, go back to the passage and find specific examples that reflect or capture those main ideas. I think that this is something that should be done kind of quickly. In fact, in some cases, it's um, something that just strikes you. Oh, I remember that the writer used this. Um, or you might even already have it in your notes on the passage that you took. So on a piece of um, notebook paper, or if you're annotating the passage, you might already have it noted. If not, just do a quick skim, focusing and reading only on examples that prove your choice or the main idea. After you do that, then you're going to want to look at your examples that you've pulled together and evaluate the extent to which each will prove the main idea. This is when you're going to weigh the pros and the cons of each. I'm also going to encourage you to think about all of them might be good, but which give me the most leverage? Which do I have the most to say? Um, what can I get the most bang for my buck for and really explore, which then gets you to determining which two examples best prove your ideas. Again, think about which two will get you the best bang for your buck. So to steep our discussion, we're going to study a passage. It's a great speech from Queen Elizabeth I that she was delivering to troops. I think it was the night before an invasion of the troops of Spain. And so she's really trying to kind of motivate them and rally them. Following our recommendations so far in our online learning sessions, I want to encourage you to pause the recording probably, and take 10 minutes, three minutes to read and study the prompt looking for the rhetorical situation, and then seven minutes to do a quick study of the speech, thinking about main ideas that are starting to emerge if you see that the path the speech is shifting from one topic to the next. So take 10 minutes, pause the feed, and then we'll apply those steps, that plan of attack using sample writing from um, from a student who is responding to this essay prompt. We're not going to pause. All right, so now let's look at it in context of the passage. Remember your first step is to select or study your topic sentence, uncover the key ideas, and the choices that you'll need to be proving or supporting in that body paragraph. For me, I like to just kind of underline or circle some of the main things I'm trying to prove. So think about this as though it's the first body paragraph in a student essay for that prompt. This is a student's topic sentence. Queen Elizabeth asserts her dominance and prowess as a female leader to highlight her authority. Take a few seconds and think about which key words or phrases will you need to prove in this body paragraph. And again, Maybe you underline a word or two here or there, or maybe you circle. For me, I think there are a few key words. Assert her dominance and prowess is one thing I'm going to have to prove in this body paragraph. I'm going to have to find choices and examples from the text that shows how she is asserting her dominance and prowess as a female leader. And then I'm going to, have to look a little bit at the function effect and the effect of how that then, why she does that to um, highlight her authority. And since her strategy, the strategy the student has taken more of the strategy approach, not a device, I get to choose which devices or which techniques I explore. So then I might ask myself, all right, if it is about her asserting her dominance and prowess as a female leader to highlight her authority, how does she achieve this? which choices are being made in order to reflect these ideas. Which takes us to step two, going back in the passage, 
looking for specific examples that capture that notion of dominance and prowess as a female leader and her authority. So make sure you're finding some specific textual evidence. And while it's fine to have references, I kind of tend to encourage students to just play it safe and have some specific textual evidence like a quotation, even if it's just a partial quotation, meaning a few words in a long, long, longer sentence. Don't dwell so much on the evidence right now. Simply find what you might consider using. Um, again, things that kind of um, struck you while you were reading the first time. To expedite the process, here are four examples that I would maybe think about. These are things that, again, kind of captured my attention while reading that I think don't do speak to her dominance and her prowess as a female leader and her authority. If you're thinking, how are these choices? You might think about how this first one, I will pick up arms, is an appeal to ethos, how it's really establishing her credibility. The second one is probably one of the most commonly used examples from this speech. It's such a good one, where the Queen, of Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth says, I know I have the body, but I'm a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king. And I'm not really sure how I might use that. I might say to myself, I think I kind of like the word choice about feeble and weak, but I also really like the imagery. So maybe I'd focus on the imagery. I don't really know yet. Right now, I'm just considering what might work. The next example, when she says that she's willing to live or die amongst you, also appeals to pathos. And then I like her opening, where she says, my loving people. And I love that word choice, um, loving. I think that that's something I might be able to use for this. So then I've got to start to decide, okay, well, of these four, which of these best prove my ideas? And that gets us to the third step in our plan of attack. And to evaluate the extent to which each of these examples prove the main idea. So I've given you a chart here. I think realistically, you wouldn't have a chart on your note paper um, while you're working on your exam. These are things you just think about. But in order to portray that visually, I thought a chart might be helpful. So you can see I have our key words, dominance and prowess, female and authority. And then I'm kind of just going to be like a check system. Can I talk about each example with dominance and prowess? So get the check. Female, check, authority, check. So with the first example, when she says, I will pick up arms, I think that's a really interesting example. It shows that she is strong enough to fight. She's willing to fight, which I think speaks to her, her authority. It's in her dominance and prowess that she has the ability. She is strong. So that speaks to dominance and prowess. I also think I could make a case about the female leadership piece as well, because it's rare for a female to fight. So I think I could write a sentence about how if, as a female, she is willing and strong enough to fight, then that speaks like her power. So I think I, I could make that one work. For the second example, I know I have the body, but I'm a weak and feeble woman, but I have a heart and stomach of a king. Remember how it's like, oh, could it be word choice, weak and feeble? If I were to go with word choice for weak and feeble, I don't think that really proves my point. So I wonder if imagery would. I focused on imagery. Maybe I look at that image of that she has the heart and stomach of a king. And so that contrast is created that she does have the heart and stomach of a king. So I would picture her, her troops would picture her as a king. And we know that kings are strong. So it doesn't really matter what her gender is because she has the, um, the interior or what she would need to effectively rule. So yeah, I think I could argue that that example would, for imagery would work with dominance and prowess, female, and authority. For the third example, when she says that she's willing to live or die amongst you, I think that that's speaking to this like ultimate sacrifice. She's willing to die with them, alongside of them. Definitely speaks to dominance and prowess and her strength. It also speaks to her authority that she's willing to sacrifice herself alongside of her, her troops. Again, I think it's similar to the first example. It's rare that a woman would fight with male troops during this time, um, let alone a queen being willing to die amongst them or a king setback. So I think I could prove the female piece too. 
All right, and then the last example, my loving people. I was originally really drawn to that because of the word choice, loving. And I think that that shows that she cares about them. And I, I do still think that that's true, but now that I think about it, I don't know that that's really going to prove my point here. I think it kind of speaks a little bit to females and how maybe she is caring, but that's not what the claim is about. The claim is about her dominance and prowess as a female leader to highlight her authority. And I don't know that that really works. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove that one. That one's not perfect, which then gets us to step four in the plan of attack and choosing the two that best prove the ideas. I have a lot of students who struggle with how many examples do I need to have for each body paragraph? And um, again, I can't give you like a, here's what you must do. I think there are so many variables, the passage, how you're feeling that day, possibly your main idea. It could even be how long your example is that maybe you have one example, but you can pick out various pieces within. But I think a good general rule of thumb is to have two. That means that your claims are going to be sufficiently supported and that hopefully you will have um, text from different places, examples from different places. So it gives you a lot to say. So I think two is a good rule of thumb, but please know that that's not an absolute. Um, there are so many things that factor into that. When I look at my chart, or if I were to write this time, right, I just look in my head, okay, of these things, which two do I think I could best prove? I think I'm gonna go with these, the second and the third example for several reasons. One, I think that the first and the third example are really kind of similar. And then if I were to weigh them side by side, I would put more stock in her being willing to live and die amongst her troops other than just picking up arms. Maybe I could put those together, but I think I've got more to say about her living and dying amongst them. And I loved my thought about the imagery where the heart and the stomach of the king, her interior is the same, so don't get so hung up on the exterior. So I like that I'm able to focus on her authority in two different ways. It's not gonna be too repetitive. So I think that those are the two that I'm gonna be able to prove the best. All right, let's practice with the second body paragraph. And this time I'm gonna have you guys do a little bit of the work. Think about this as, again, the second body paragraph, the one that follows. And here is the topic sentence, the very first sentence of that body paragraph. It writes, the student writes, furthermore, Queen Elizabeth showcases her leadership by utilizing rousing diction to inspire the troops to fight Spain valiantly. Try it on your own. Pause the feed. Identify what choice the student wants to explore, choice or strategy the student, um, or strategy or device the student wants to explore in this body paragraph and underline any key ideas that the student will have to prove. So pause the feed and then we'll share some ideas. We're not going to, um, but for the record, this All is right. always stuff you can for go me, back to if you just want more practice. Circled or underlined, rousing diction to inspire them to fight valiantly. And I will say, I did pause a little bit at the leadership because I had a leadership circle with the previous exam or previous paragraph, except I think in this case, her leadership is really about inspiring the troops to fight Spain valiantly. So I don't know that that's as crucial of a piece. I think in the first paragraph, it was not just her leadership, it was her female leadership. And this body paragraph is going to focus more on her inspiration. So I'm only gonna highlight those, those few words. Just so we're all on the same page. Rousing diction, whenever you're choosing, word choice is a very common thing for students to examine in an essay. You always wanna have some sort of a tone word or adjective attached to it. In this case, the student chose the word rousing, which means to induce excitement, to stir, to move them. And then valiantly means to fight um, or to attack something with braveness or courage or strength. So I want you to follow the next step, which is to pause the feed, go back into the speech and see if you can find examples of rousing diction, specific words that will incite some energy or some motivation in her troops. All right, here are four that really stuck out to me. The words tyrant in line six, the word tyrant in line six, 
famous victory in line 37, valor 36, and armed multitudes in Florida. When I skim the passage, those are the words I think really speak to fighting Spain valiantly or words that might really speak to motivating her troops. So again, I want you to pause now and think through that step three of, of these examples. Can you justify how each speaks to rousing diction and to inspire the troops to fight valiantly? Think about the extent to which each of these examples can prove those ideas. All right. So again, I'm using the chart. If you were to do this in a time writing setting, I think these are just things you would ask yourself. You probably wouldn't list them out at, on a chart like this. Probably not. Let's start with this example of tyrants. And I think that that's a really good word because instead of referring to them as Spain or the Spaniards, she's referring to them as tyrants, people who are cruel and oppressive, um, rulers who act too aggressively. So I think that word choice really does speak to how they are humans, they're tyrants. So it removes that, that face, makes them less human, which I think would probably rouse them because it makes them want to defeat something as terrible as a tyrant. Famous victory she references toward the end of her speech. And I think that that's rousing because it lets the troops know that this battle is going to go down in history. It's something that will live in people's memories. That too might inspire them because it's a more noble act. It's not just a fight. It's a battle that will lead to a famous victory. It's positive, it's uplifting that they're going to win the victory and that it will last people's minds. It'll stay famous. When it comes to valor, she's kind of flattering them a little bit when she's describing their valor in the field. So I guess that might be rousing. But when I think about that, it's really just like reassuring them of their capabilities. So I, I think I could make the case that reassuring them will rouse them and inspire them to fight valiantly, but I think it's gonna take a little bit of extra work to prove. And then looking at armed multitudes, at first glance, I really liked this phrase, armed multitudes, but then when I went back and I studied the past, I realized she's not, she's speaking to Spain and that those are the armed multitudes they're facing. So that one's not gonna work either. So if I were to go through and check things off, this is what it might look like, which means if I'm going to get to step four of my plan of attack, which two are the best, I'm gonna go with tyrants and famous victory. Valor is so close in approximation to the famous victory phrase that maybe I could pull that one in and kind of have three examples and make famous victory and valor combined. So maybe I'll do that when I write, but I'm going to make the bulk of my paragraph focus on tyrants and famous victories. All right, so just to reveal, there are four main steps when it comes to selecting appropriate evidence. And as the rubric says, the most important piece is to make sure it supports your line of reason, supports your claim. So you have to start by identifying what is it that I'm setting forth to prove and which choice which choice is, in some cases, best prove that. Then you go back and you look in the text quickly to see which of those pieces, which of those examples or choices might help prove those main ideas. Then I'm going to consider the extent to which they prove the ideas and then choose the two that I think I can work the most with. Before we break for the day, I wanna give you a few tips or things to remember, some keys to keep in mind when it comes to selecting appropriate evidence. Again, I would make sure it's specific and concrete. You could have a specific reference to the text, but just make sure it is something concrete. Um, the more specific, the better. I'd also encourage you to make sure you have a or an accurate understanding of the example. Remember how I looked at that example of the armed multitudes? When I took just that phrase, I thought it would work until I went back and I read it in context and I read that whole sentence and I realized I did not understand that correctly. Another way you might approach it is to paraphrase the example. That will help to ensure do you understand it as clearly key. as you think you do. Another tip I give you is to make sure you're picking evidence from a variety of places in the text. You'll notice I didn't have examples only in the very beginning of the speech. I had some in the beginning, I think one or two in the middle with the um, weak and feeble woman, 
and then at the very end, demonstrate that you have an understanding of the entire passage, not just from one spot. Here's another little tip. When it comes to what is appropriate, don't forget about the audience or the genre. So for example, if it's a speech, I don't think I'm gonna pick a choice like um, a dash because if I'm an audience member, state like we've been looking at um, a graduation dress, if I'm sitting in this large arena, listening to someone give a, an address, I'm not gonna hear a dash, but I might recognize a dash or a semicolon in a letter. So keep that in mind that maybe the audience or the genre will help kind of guide your choices a little bit too. And then the last thing is, is something that I'm finding with my students is make sure you're selecting choices that you can really explain. I think that sometimes students will select a choice and then they end up proving something else. So for example, if it's word choice, if you're saying that that's your choice, then make sure you're really looking at the denotations and connotations of those words and then what effect they have. If it's repetition, think it is about the word, but it's really about that word being repeated and how does that impact the audience? Or something like imagery, make sure you're pulling out a specific image in that quote that you wanna to study to then explain how it functions or what effect it has. When you pick a choice, make sure you're really justifying and explaining that choice. All right, so for your guided practice for tonight, I've given you the third body paragraph in this essay. The topic well, sentence we're not reads, doing that, but... finally, to so signal it's our last paragraph, Katie's ideas. Let's see if she has anything All right, left to say. Weekend. Not really. Um, um, I hope you have a restful weekend. Being yes, thank you, Amy. How does that um, Emily, whatever her name is. I'm just going back for just a second to, to go back over this list. Um, the third one on here, picking evidence from a variety of places in the text, that's really more strictly for rhetorical analysis, like you have to pick sort of a variety with synthesis because you're picking stuff from three different um, three different sources. But all of the rest of it's really important for every genre of essay that we're writing. Um, have specific evidence and obviously like you're choosing quotes for a synthesis essay um, and you would be from, from a rhetorical analysis as well, um, including concrete evidence have an accurate understanding of the example. That's really important because sometimes I do see people putting in a quote that doesn't really go anywhere. There's not really an explanation to why you picked that quote. And also just keep in mind that it may make total sense to you in your head why you picked the quote and you may think that it is so obvious that it goes without saying. That's not, not, that's not really always the case. Sometimes you do need to kind of connect those dots for the reader a little bit more clearly. Um, I mean, I like what she said about the audience and genre, but it's again, kind of more relevant to rhetorical analysis. But I feel like this last one select choices you can explain kind of goes back in with what I was just saying that if you're picking a quote from a source you want to make sure that you can explain why you picked that quote or like what's the relevance of that particular quote and even go like err on the side of explaining too much. Um, definitely better to explain too much and have me kind of think like, yeah, we get it rather than just putting like plunking down a quote in the middle of it's it. Too Thank oh you. With like, <laughs> with like no idea why you've picked that quote, if that makes sense. Usually I'm <laughs> sometimes he sneaks up on you the funny thing is this happens all the time like i'll have my laptop open working at home and i'll be on the phone with somebody and they're like is there a man in your apartment <laughs> like no it's just my computer um where is my mouse good lord i'm trying to stop sharing um the only thing I was going to say before I let you guys go, and yeah, I know that we have a few minutes left of class, but I'm going to let you guys go a little bit early today, is just that if you did not already get your essay turned in and the short assignment from the other day, you can still get 90% of your credit if you turn it in today. So I definitely highly recommend that. 80% if you do it tomorrow, 70% the day after that, 60% the day after that. 50% next Monday. And then after that, no credit. Um, okay, so tomorrow I will be giving you the sources for the essay that we'll write on Friday. 
Uh, we'll kind of briefly go through those together, but I'm mostly letting you kind of have that stuff on your own and do the work that way. So um, I will see you virtual folks tomorrow. I'm really trying to end the call, but I can't find my mouse.